Good morning and welcome to Cedardale. We're so pleased to have you once again. This is a splendid time now. We're entering the early days of autumn and the earth is getting ready to go to sleep. But we have a great message of awakening and renewal from our pastor today. But before he comes to speak, I want to remind you, first of all, that next week is Communion Sunday, so be prepared for that. Uh, have a little juice and a cracker ready for the service next week. This week, though, we are moving on, and we're going to read the scripture for today, which is from Jeremiah chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They, like a tree, will be planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought, and it never fails to bear fruit. That's the word for today. So I will now turn you over to our wonderful pastor. Good morning. It's good to see everyone today. I hope you are having a wonderful weekend. But let's uh, jump right into our message today. Our message is entitled, Beauty for Ashes. So no matter where you are in this world, whether you're from Georgina, Perfala, Ontario, or the world, I want to invite you to this wonderful truth today that we're going to soon hear. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day and for the opportunity to be in this moment, in this place, as a servant of the Most High. We thank you for the opportunities you give. We thank you for the blessings, and we thank you for the wonders which are yours, which you give mightily. And we thank you, Lord, for this truth today, beauty for ashes. We thank you that it's a text that speaks of what you do, Lord. And we give you praise and glory now in your house. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. My text today, I'll be soon reading, will be from Isaiah 61, verses 1 to 3. But Psalm 30, verse 11 says this, you have, turned me for, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. Isaiah 61, verse 10 also says this, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments. And as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Now our text today is Isaiah 61, 1-3. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of despair, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. During World War II, Christian author Corey Ten Boom and her family were arrested by the Nazis for protecting Jewish people. Corey and her sister were sent to Ravensbrück prison camp north of Berlin. Between 1939 and 1945, over 130,000 female prisoners passed through the Ravensbrück camp system. Only 40,000 survived. Here is part of Corey's own testimony where she says, Far from my home in Holland, my sister Bestie and I were now to be within the shadow of the crematorium. Every day about 600 bodies were being burned alive in that crematory. When I saw the smoke go up in the air, I asked myself, when will it be my time to die? I did not know beforehand that I should be set free by a miracle of God. It came in the, hand, in the form of a blunder by a prison official just one week before the Germans killed all the women of my age. I have looked death in the eye not once but several times, and what a joy it was that Jesus was with me and that I knew that he had died on a cross for all the sins of the world 
and for my sin as well. I was not afraid. I knew that when they killed me, I would go to my father in heaven. Corey Ten Boom was trapped in one of history's worst prisons, but she was already free because she had trusted in the good news of the cross. She trusted in the great message of God's only begotten son, the king of all kings. The good news of salvation is the great theme of the whole Bible. The free offer of his glorious gospel is universal in its scope and sway. And brethren, there is nothing narrow or limited about the good news of salvation. Friends, if anyone asks you, what is the main message of the Bible? You can tell them the message is the wonderful news of salvation through Christ alone. Throughout the Old Testament, our Messiah is presented as the one who will come with unexpected joys, the one who will bring the kingdom, bring forgiveness, bring the age of salvation, the one who will die for the transgressions of his people, the one who will become the substitute, the sacrifice, the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. So the Old Testament gloriously looks forward to the grand entrance and coming of our mighty Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Our text today was written 700 years before Jesus was born, and it applies to him alone. The word proclaim in verses 1 and 2 means to cry out with a loud voice. The word proclaim reminds us we've got good news so big and so wonderful, it needs to be heralded from every rooftop. Our God is a great giver. He gives his people beauty for ashes. When the people of Isaiah's day mourned, they poured ashes on their heads and went about mourning and wailing in great despair. The beauty God mentions here is the picture of a beautiful crown, like a diadem of beauty. Jesus is saying with abounding hope, I will wash away your ashes of grief and give you a beautiful crown of joy. Jesus, the mighty one, traveling in the greatness of his strength, according to Isaiah 63, 1, was appointed to bring the good news of salvation to mankind. And verse 1 of Isaiah 61, all three persons of the Holy Trinity are mentioned, the Spirit, the Sovereign Lord, and the Messiah, who is the Anointed One. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings or good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to the prisoners. Having predicted in chapter 60 the blessing that Zion will enjoy, Isaiah now prophesies of the Holy One who will bring those blessings, the Messiah or Isaiah's suffering servant. These words, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, cannot be dislocated from the great moment at the River Jordan. When, after our Lord was baptized by John the Baptist, the heavens were opened, and the Spirit, like a dove, rested upon him. And the Heavenly Father says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. After Jesus' anointing, he went into the howling wilderness to be heckled by Satan. There he was tempted and tried like no one has ever been, and came forth triumphant because he followed the will of the Heavenly Father. Surrendering completely to God's will for your life and standing faithfully in temptation's battles is the necessary preparation for life and ministry. It is the victory in these battles that causes us to walk in the power of the Spirit of God. Even 40 days of the fiercest temptation humanly imaginable could not deprive Jesus of God's holy anointing. Then he went to Galilee, stood up in the synagogue of Nazareth, and announced the anointing he had received and what his ministry would be because of the anointing of the Spirit of God. Brethren, if our Lord and Savior needed it, how much more do we? He did not attempt to bind up the brokenhearted, proclaim liberty to the captives, or the opening of the prison to the bound. He would not preach or teach or comfort or communicate joy until that holy unction had been imparted upon him. How absurd, friends, as it is for us to attempt similar works without this anointing of the Spirit of God. The Bible reveals characteristics of a world full of brokenhearted captives, prisoners, and mourners needing divine help and deliverance. Man is so broken, yes, and fallen, that he needs the whole Trinity to help him. When Jesus was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, at that synagogue in Nazareth that day, he spoke these powerful words. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, 
because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue that day were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Isaiah 61 goes on to proclaim not only the year of the Lord's favor, but also the day of vengeance of our God. A day of judgment is coming, friend, when Christ returns. Those who have refused and rejected Christ will face an eternity apart from the presence of God. Until then, we are living in the year of the Lord's favor because Christ died and rose again for our sins. Salvation by grace through faith is now available for everyone who repents and believes in the atoning work of the cross of Calvary. Even as bad news swirls and twirls around us, the good news of God's forgiveness and reconciliation is freely given. The Apostle Paul's words to the Corinthians are still true. As God's fellow workers, we urge you to not receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you now, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 1-2. Isaiah chapter 61 shows us God's power at work. God doesn't need a magic wand. He doesn't use spells. We learn that God has power to work out his plan for his people. Here's how it starts. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. God's message works. His proclamation has power. His words have power to bring healing. And there is always power in his mighty proclamations. So I only have two points today. A very simple outline. Grace is the first point. Growth is the second. First, we'll look at grace. Who gives this mighty word? None other than the king of righteousness and the heir of glory. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. Now we will see his gracious words to mourners because no barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessing on the weary and the woeful. Remember, it's a gracious word to those who mourn in Zion. God's Son gives this powerful and gracious word for hope and consolation. And it comes from the Savior, and he is the superlative of everything that's good. And it comes from him who said, it is said, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Jehovah Rophi is the name of Jesus. He is the physician of men's souls, and by his stripes we are healed, according to Isaiah 53, 5. He took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses, and he is able now with a word to heal all our diseases, whatever they may be. Do you know him? Our gracious Redeemer is also described as a liberator. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound. And he can liberate you, and he can liberate I. Friends, in ancient times, there were so many downcast persons in Israel because so many had become bankrupt, and destitute, and had lost everything, including their estates, and had sunk further into debt, till they were obliged, yes, they were obliged to sell their own children into horrible and dreadful slavery. Ruined and ravaged they were. Their yoke was heavy, and their trouble was atrocious and vexing. But the fiftieth year came around, and then never was their herd's music so sweet in all of Israel. When the silver trumpets were taken down on the jubilee morning, and the loud blasts of, were blown in every city and village in all of Israel from Dan to Beersheba. Do you hear it? Do you hear it? Yes, it's the word free. It says you're free. Those blasts meant you're free. Oh, I hope you're free today. Yes, our mighty Savior has power, as the text declares, to proclaim liberty to the captives. He can shatter the prison doors, and he can set those convicted and condemned free. He is the only one who can comfort your soul and mine, though we may be mourning. Rejoice at his coming. The words of Isaiah 61, 1-3 should resonate in all of Christendom today. In every church across Canada and the world, bells, bells should be tolling. Yes, for he came to bring good news to the afflicted, to bind up the brokenhearted, 
and to proclaim liberty to the captives, God's people who are in calamity or desolation or difficult circumstances will have God's gracious attention. And you know what? If there's anyone's attention I want, it's God's. I want his eyes upon me. I desire his ear tuned to my cry. I desire to be huddled underneath the umbrella of his gracious protection. The Bible says that Jesus will give us beauty for ashes. There is nothing beautiful about ashes. But the scripture says that God can take your difficult, disgusting, horrible situations and give you beauty for them. And he is going to pick you up out of the ashes of life and make something beautiful out of you. You may feel like your situation is ugly right now, but sometimes things that appear ugly just need the right climate to grow. Did you know there is a species of plant called a maguey, native to Mexico and Central America? It grows for years with great leaves as thick as two hands put together. It's three inches thick and very long. It puts out sharp thorns and it's just as ugly as can be. The longer it's alive and the more it grows, it gets uglier all the time. <laughs> but it suddenly it shoots up in a couple of days and a great shaft, tall and thick, begins to grow. It decks its spreading head with thousands of flowers and becomes a beautiful plant. The possibility of all that fragrant beauty was always in that detestable ugliness. Just as the fragrance of your life is sometimes hidden underneath, it's smothered by daily schedules and the monotonous grind of life. Yet great things can come about because of God's amazing grace. Isaiah said, God will give you beauty for ashes. God knew you'd be burnt in life's experiences, but he also knew he could replace the burnt out mess with something beautiful. Fallen human nature will mourn forever, except, there's a big word here, except God's amazing grace changes it. Bill Grather wrote a song once time, and it said this, something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, Jesus understood. All I have to offer him is brokenness and strife, but he made something beautiful out of my life. God can turn the tears of mourning into the oil of joy. And did you know oil was used to apply to the face to make the face shine? Instead of mourning, which disfigures the face and makes it unlovely, light olive oil, when applied to one's face and hair, would soothe and brighten one's spirits, dispelling the mourning. The Bible speaks of the Holy Spirit as being the comforter. The oil of joy is blessing of the Holy Spirit. He comes to soothe like oil and refresh like a well of living water. He comes to pour upon you and I joy unspeakable, as 1 Peter 1.8 will talk about. The spirit of despair or heaviness includes inner hurts, depression, despair, dejection, hopelessness, brokenheartedness, suicidal tendencies, self-pity, excessive mourning, sorrow, or grief. Did you know that the spirit of heaviness has a way of stealing our joy? And without joy, we have a flesh-like tendency to move into self-pity, which is exactly where Satan wants every child of God. Satan desires us to be caught up in the valley of self-pity. He wants us to feel sorry for ourselves. He wants us to feel alone, deserted, and depressed. But don't let him lead you down that pathway, friend. But whenever we find ourselves hating for the valley of self-pity and hopelessness, we must clutch the word of God. For the Bible declares all things work to good, together for good to them that love God, to those who are called according to his purpose in Romans 8, 28. Have you ever watched the movie Unbroken? The movie tells the life story of Louis Zamperini. As a child, he was always getting into trouble. That is until he discovered his gift for running. He earned a college scholarship and competed in the Olympics. Then World War II broke out. And Louis was drafted into the Army forces and served on a bomber. On one mission, though, his plane crashed in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, far from land. He and a few other airmen found a rubber life raft and managed to survive the open ocean, hunger, lack of water, and even survived shark attacks. When they made land, they, they walked straight into the arms of Japanese forces who imprisoned them and beat them and tortured them. The story highlights the especially violent physical and psychological abuse inflicted upon Louis by one of the Japanese prison guards. But the war came to an end, and Louis was free 
and given a hero's welcome back home. That's where the movie ends. And if that were the end of the story, it would be a triumph of Louis' spirit and his toughness to never give up. But the book continues, you see. Louis enjoyed his new life and his celebrated status. He married, he was toasted at parties, but inside he was unraveling. He was consumed by hatred over what had happened to him. He had fantasies of revenge against the chief tormentor. He developed a problem with alcohol. He was falling apart. Finally, his wife, half out of desperation, invited him to come hear a young traveling evangelist by the name of Billy Graham. That's where we, he heard the wonderful message that saved his life. He learned that he was forgiven by Jesus Christ. That though he, that through that forgiveness, he was able to let go of the hurts and wrongs and the sufferings that the terrible atro atrocities were inflicted upon him. And he even sought out his captors after the war to extend forgiveness to them. Second point, growth. When he gives us beauty for ashes, we know our times are in the best of hands because God means it for good. It is the mandate of King Jesus to appoint and to give. Have you forgotten that King Jesus can break the vicious cycle of devastation sin has caused? The rich comforts of the glorious gospel are given. And by the Holy Spirit, at the command of Christ, Jesus upon every mourner in the time when they need them. Joe Shriven came from Ireland to be a missionary to the Iroquois more than a hundred years ago. He left his fiancée in Ireland, and when, she fi when he finally sailed across the ocean, she was killed in a tragic accident. Here was a man who loved God, who had to bury his fiancée with his own hands. A year later, he wrote home to his mother with these wonderful words, What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. And friend, that's exactly what we must learn to do. Jesus wants you and I to see that he is the only way out of the vicious cycle caused by sin. He is the only oasis in, the, in this life. So keep yourselves in the love of God. You know, it's only Jesus who can erase all our efforts at scorekeeping. Jesus has a better solution than we humans have devised, where victims retaliate and where grievances are aired and spewed. Jesus has good news to proclaim and announce. But it's not just words Jesus gives. Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit to carry out his Heavenly Father's will. The good news Jesus delivers is that he, he was actually sent to accomplish he is sent to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim freedom to the captives and the release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and to comfort all who mourn in Zion. Oh, friends, the words of Jesus have amazing power and Jesus uses his powerful words to actually transform. Jesus changes you. Jesus changes me. He gives you a bouquet of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, and a praising heart instead of a languid spirit. Instead of funeral, funeral clothes, you will be given wedding garments. Instead of dread over what you've done or anger over what someone has done to you, Jesus gives you the oil of joy to sing his praises. And you know what? We've all been invited to come to him so you and I can have access to God. We have the awesome dignity of serving our Savior as a sinner who has received God's great forgiveness. And you and I, yes, you and I can become an instrument for God to distribute his forgiveness to others. Jesus showed his true power when he came as God's servant. The life of Jesus made the words of Isaiah a powerful reality. The powerful life of Jesus promises uh, he gives awesome power. Yes, he works his wonderful forgiveness powerfully in human hearts though through the proclamation of his mighty word. His word has power to transform. His proclamation has healing power. And it's a grand and glorious God whom we serve. It is a grand and glorious life of fellowship with him to which we are called. And it deserves our most sincere living. A.W. Tozer once said, Low views of God destroy the gospel for all who hold them. And you and I can become oaks of righteousness for the praise of his glory. Did you know what? 
God is most glorified in you when you're most satisfied in him, said John Piper. And what does it mean then? It means you are called upon to display his glory. Show that he's glorious. Act like he's glorious. Make much of him like he's the most valuable, glorious thing in the universe. You know why? Because he is. And that was said by John Piper. Do you know what? In conclusion, Robert Murray McShane said famously and wisely, for every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Jesus. Why did God create the universe and you and I? The resounding answer, rolling like thunder through all the Bible, is God made you and God made the universe for his glory. If you begin to fathom that, everything changes. Everything changes if that becomes a part of the fabric of the thinking and your feeling, says John Piper. Yes, it is Christ that changes everything. This morning, God extends his loving arms through his son, Jesus. He invites you to come and stands willing and able to heal the hurt that's in your life. And I pray that you will respond today. Every good gift is from God. And best of all, he has given himself. This, that's what Jesus did when he died on a cross for your sins. He is our giver. So why does he give? It says so in Isaiah 61, 3, where Jesus tells us that he was sent by the Heavenly Father to give beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for a spirit of despair. You, your praise of him is not dependent on your circumstances, but your circumstances are dependent upon your praise of him. Our praises prepare us for wonders and to allow us into his gates of his presence, enter into, in, into his gates of with the thanksgiving and his courts with praise, to be thankful unto him and bless his holy name. Did you know that praise is a God-honoring celebration? Praise is acknowledging and celebrating the person and work of God and what he has done through his darling son, Jesus Christ, and through the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We celebrate who he is, not simply what he has done for us or what, can do, what he can do for us. And we can praise him for what he has done and what he is continuing to do. Oh, friends, the Hebrew word for praise is halal, the word which is the root of hallelujah, which means to boast, to shine, to be clamorous, to rave, to make a show, to celebrate. Praise is a beautiful from the heart, unsolicited response in the midst of favorable or unfavorable circumstances. Let me repeat, our praises are not dependent upon our circumstances, for our, our God is a mighty God. Give voice to your joy with praise and choose celebration. Praise him because God loves us and offers a wonderful plan for us. And you know what? We all need to remember what I'm going to tell you right now. This is a very wonderful prayer. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O oh, divine Lord, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, and not so much to be understood as to understand, not so much to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and in dying we wake to eternal life, said St. Francis of Assisi. Do you know something? There should be no reason for our discouragement. The truths of the gospel are open to us. And give him your unyielding faithfulness and stay devoted to Christ. That is from my heart today. I pray you'll trust him and reach out for him and seek him while he may be found. And you too, right now, today, friend, will know the great exchange, the beauty that he gives for the ashes that are in our life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for what you've done in my life, giving me that great exchange. I pray it will happen to someone today. I pray it will happen to many today. I pray that they'll come to know Jesus today because he is the great giver who gave himself for us. We thank you now, Lord, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.